Well, we are in um, the final week of our series, Why We Worship, and um, it's been awesome to kind of unpack Why We Worship, to find the scripture in the songs we're singing and see what kind of fueled the response of worship that comes out of it. Really, the three-week rhythm has been this. The first week we unpacked why we worship is because he is holy. And because of his holiness, we were set apart. But in Christ Jesus, we were called, we were allowed, we were invited to boldly approach God. No longer held back by any religious structure, made free and open to approach God through Christ Jesus. But also then the, we had the second week, and we worship God because he's sovereign. In this world, as Jesus said, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That is what Jesus said. And we recognize the sovereignty of God is um, is one of those things that lets us know that um, we are God's handiwork, but he didn't have us. We're not here by happenstance. God has a plan. He is sovereign, and God surrenders no authority or power in this world apart from what he desires to give up or what he wills to give up. And we understand that God has um, been gracious in his sovereignty to call us back to himself. And today, we lean in to the question why we worship to, to find the answer we worship because he loves us. I want you to think about that for a minute. He loves us. Now, I know in rooms like this, there are people who've grown up under the abusive tyrant homes they may have lived in as children, where they were physically hurt by people who were supposed to love them, where they were verbally assaulted and their character and their identity was just mangled by people who only knew sharp and cutting words. I understand that that is part of this life and it's a horrible part, but we need to understand the God who loves us, loves us in a way that he first demonstrated recklessly and courageously to us in Christ Jesus. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He did for us the thing we could never do on our own. And he leaned into a reckless love that would abandon himself on our behalf. I know for you and I that we get into this, um, we, we have this identity, especially as Americans, that we kind of set our own destiny. But um, I don't know if we ever stop to realize that God loves us and he shows it in finding us when we were lost. Let's do it this way. Who here has ever lost something valuable to them? Help me out here. So some people have never lost anything. To which I say, don't lie in church or elsewhere. Who here has ever lost something? Help me out, right? I'm used to paying book fines at the end of school years, even when I'm not in school. I'm used to looking for keys, having secret keys, and then forgetting where I hid them. Who here has ever had this when maybe kids, you can help me out. You, you come home, and we'll, we'll pick on dad in this service. We come home, and you reach us for the phone, and like they're looking like, Oh, um, where's my phone? Okay, stop. <laughs> Has anyone seen my phone? And everybody goes, no. And you're like, everyone, where have you come from? You to the car, you to the trunk. You look under seats, you remove whatever you have to. You go check in the bathroom. Don't ask why. It was in there. I was playing Fruit Ninja. And you just, get, you know, you're working out and you're telling people, search for my phone. 30 minutes later, everybody's on edge because you still can't find it. And you're like, I cannot believe that not one of you can help me find <laughs> I appreciate it. We will tear the house apart to find car keys. Haven't you ever done it? You're in the house and you're like, where are my keys? Where are my keys? Can someone, and from your soul comes a rage-filled scream of keys, you know, and you just, you want them, and you can't find them. We lose things all the time, and we will tear a house apart. I love the sunglass trick. We're like, mom's walking around, she's like, who used them? Who used my sunglasses? You're going down. All of you, mac and cheese for a month. To which I'm like, ew, I love mac and cheese. But you know, you're going down. Where are my sunglasses? And one brave child is like, on your head? And mom's like, I know. You're my favorite. Get in the car. 
You know, and everybody's like, okay. We don't even know where we're going. We weren't leaving. We just wanted sunglasses, right? When we lose things, we'll, we'll go crazy. It's kind of naturally born into us. Here's what I love. We often say, what is the image of God in humanity? I actually think our psychotic searching and reckless devouring of a clean home to find keys and different things might give us a hint of God's character. We're gonna find out about that in Luke chapter 15 when we get to see what reckless love looks like from the eyes of God through the mouth of Jesus Christ as he tells us three stories. He speaks three stories out and it says this. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this guy welcomes sinners and eats with them. Tax collectors and sinners, bad. Pharisees, scribes, religious good people. They've got good moral lives, okay? And they're judging who Jesus eats with. So Jesus tells them this parable. Which one of you, which one of you having a having hundred sheep and losing one of them does not leave 99 sheep in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost and looks until he finds it? And when he has found it, Lays it on his shoulders. I always think Keith Green. Anybody with me? Okay, I can be alone. It's good. I did it all my teen years. All right. Um, so he puts the sheep on his shoulders, and he rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, and he says to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. That's Jesus taking his finger and shoving it deep into the eye socket of religious people. They're just like, oh, I don't like that. Because Jesus is saying, if you have it all together and don't need to repent, that doesn't please God. Here's what pleases God. When one who is lost is found. When I leave 99 to get one. And that one knows it's lost and needs help. Or... What woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one, one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? What woman doesn't turn over the house to find her wallet or find the, the debit card is what it's saying. When she has found it, she calls and gathers her friends and neighbors and saying, rejoice with me for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, Jesus tells them, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then Jesus says, there was a man and he had two sons. The younger of the sons said to his father, dad, give me the share of the property that belong, will belong to me. That is speaking future tense. Hey dad, when you die, how much am I gonna get? I'd like that check. Now, happy Father's Day, right? All right, so, um, so the father takes and divides up the property between them, between the son, the older son, and, and the father. So a third of the estate goes. A few day, days later, the son gathered all he had, traveled to a distant country, and there he squanders all, that his, all his property in dissolute living, and when he had spent everything, a severe famine took place in, throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of this faraway country who sent him into the field to feed the pigs. Note on Jewish people, they don't touch pigs. Pigs are unclean. I know, no bacon, right? None. Okay, maybe you're good with that. I'm not. So th this would be a big deal. For him to not only be around pigs is just, I mean, the, the Pharisees and scribes would be like, oh, we don't do that. But then Jesus goes on to say, he would gladly have filled himself with the, let's replace pods with slop that the pigs were eating. Yet no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants and hands have bread enough to have bread enough for the day and to spare. But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. He's rehearsing his speech. Do you hear him? He's kind of like, This is what I'm going to say. I am no longer worthy to be your son. Treat me like one of your hired servants. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far away, his father saw him, and he was filled with compassion. 
and he ran. Rich people don't run in the Old Testament, okay? They're not like trendy millennial runners who've got money. They don't have a bun and just jog for no reason. They don't run. The father takes off running. He puts his arm around him. He kisses him, and he said to him, and the son looks at his father and says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. He knows this, doesn't he? The father didn't need this confession. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one. Put it on him, put a ring on his finger, and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive now. He was lost and now he's found. And they began to celebrate. Now, the older brother was in the field. And when he came, coming home and approached the house, he heard music and dancing and he called one of the slaves and he asked them what was going on. He replied, your brother's come home and your father killed the fatted calf because he's gotten him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So the father goes out again and began to plead with him. But the older brother answered his father, listen, for all of these years, I have been working like a slave for you. I have never disobeyed your command. Yet, you have never given me even a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, when this son of yours came back and he devoured your property with prostitutes, You killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me. All that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and he's come to life. He was lost and now he's been found. This story starts to tell us about the reckless love of God. Three times, Jesus unpacks a situation of dire panic to find something valuable. Three times, Jesus tells stories about a love for something that would cause you to disrupt all rhythm and lifestyle to find what mattered. Three times, Jesus leans in and tells us, God has been recklessly in love with us since the very beginning. He would do anything to save that which he loves. He would do anything to return to him the thing that bore his image, the creation that the Father loves so much. He gives us an image. The first one is is the shepherd. I love this image because it says he leaves the 99 to go after the one. I don't know if you know this, but sheep are a whole different version of stupid. There's like not smart and then there's sheep, right? Sheep do things, that they just, first of all, they have no natural defenses. They are the, um, the little Chinese dumpling for nature. You know, there's just, it's soft, it's easy, just tear in and eat, right? That's what they are. They, they have no natural defenses. They have no claws. They barely have little hooves. They can't really defend themselves with that. No one's ever been bit by a sheep and it mattered. They're just not that good. But not only that, they're grossly unintelligent. You send one sheep walking off a cliff and they're just like, Mah, and they just take off. They'll, they'll all walk off a cliff just because, well, Bernie's doing it and off they go. And they'll all die the same death and be like, oh, I wonder what that screaming is, you know? They're just not smart. They'll go get a drink out of a stream, and if it's moving too fast, they stick their little woolly head into it. The hair gets wet. Oh, my head's feeling heavy. Their back legs come up. They find him four miles downstream doing that, you know? They're just not bright. They need a shepherd. They need someone who looks out for their best interest because they're too dumb to do so. Congratulations, we are the sheep. We are the sheep. We walk away. We're just like, wow, oh, I wonder what that is. Off we go to our own demise. But what does it say? It says that Jesus loves us so much. He is the good shepherd who seeks out. He leaves the 99 to go find the one. And he says, heaven rejoices when one of us is found. And we get to live in the tension and the hope that we have a heavenly father. Because that's the the 
third story that Jesus tells in this. Jesus tells the story of a father, and it tells you and me one thing, that you and I are children of God. Never mistake the importance of an individual relationship with Jesus Christ. You are not saved being in church. Being in church doesn't get you to heaven. Knowing Jesus Christ Confession, repentance, receiving salvation, and being in a relationship with Jesus Christ is what eternal life's about not going to church. Now this is awesome because we gather together and we worship God, but we have a heavenly father who loves us and has called us his children. And I wonder if the church has forgotten that magnificent truth that we are children of almighty God and he loves us with this reckless, not fearless, but courageous abandon. And he loves us and he will leave all that is settled. He will leave heaven and glory to come down to earth to redeem you and I. On a hill he created, he will spread out his arms and die on a cross so that you and I don't die eternally. He's our heavenly father. There is hope upon hope in this. And we get to know this father who waits and longs. His eyes are ever outward. He's attend- our God's heart is towards the child. And I think it's important that we understand the heart of the father, the heart of a parent in this. Because often in church, we make it this this rigorous thing, this religious thing that we have to do. I remember when uh, our kids are getting older, which is awesome and provides new opportunities for we get to act like adults again, Erica. But, um, but, but it, I miss, if I'm honest, some of the days when they were little. You know, just fat little babies. They were awesome. And, um, and I remember especially my daughter, Isabella. She didn't like me too much. Um, it hurt my feelings. You probably shouldn't laugh. Um, <laughs> wrong. But she didn't like me. She didn't, like, literally. She did not dig me. I would come home and be like, hey, Bella Boo. And she'd be like, ah! And I'm like, there, take her, whatever. She had a pretty dress, little barrettes in her little hair with bald spots everywhere, just looking like a little baby girl. You know, I'd pick her up, hey, boo, and she's just like, boo, and she'd break down. But there were some days where I'd come home and those big blue eyes would be like, oh, and she would see me, I'm like, oh, I know, right? I would pick her up, I would sit down, and I'd cross my leg and kind of sit her right here, and I would kind of poke at her and play with her, and maybe that's why she didn't like me, but, um, but I would play with her, and she'd be super interactive. She would smile and giggle, and she looked so stinking cute in her little dresses, and she was so precious, and I just loved it, and I would, I would just, oh, I was like drinking it in. I just loved it when she liked me, when she, when she, when she was into me, and Erica would say, sometimes tickling can hurt them, so you, you should probably play softly. I'm like, Mama doesn't know. Mama doesn't know. And I'm like, do, 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 do. You know, I'm like, like she's an iPhone. I'm just poking buttons, squeezing her legs. And eventually that little lip, <laughs> I'm like, oh, it's about to break. And then she would just fall apart crying. I would have to hand her off. And Erica said, I told you 10 minutes ago it was probably enough. And I was like, it was enough. It wasn't enough here. You know, I just, I wanted to be near. Can you get with me? The image of father, that that the father waits for the child to come and longs for that time together, longs for the time. I didn't look at Bella and say, you know, you're almost a year now. I mean, what's up with the diapers and bottles? Can we move along? No, no. We talked about stuff. Who needs their pants changed? We would have these conversations. It was fun. It was loving. It was close. It was intimate. I didn't care that she couldn't speak back to me. Eye contact was enough. Presence was enough. Enjoying me just visually and looking at me and leaning in, hugging me. I loved it. When did we forget that that's our Heavenly Father's view of us? And we think, okay, I got to get cleaned up before I come to God. And he's like, no, you can't do it. Just come. Come. The words of the song I love so much from Reckless Love. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Have we ever thought about the kindness of God? My wife loves to sing, especially when our kids were little, would sing over them when they were babies. And it was, I loved it. They each had their own little song. I could hear it ringing through the house. And it was awesome. 
And when I hear this, before I took a breath, you were singing over me. As a parent delights, as a mom delights in her baby, singing over them, pouring their heart out with no response. That child's still gonna get up at 2.30, scream at you, mess its pants, and want food. But it didn't stop the song over them. Because the love of the mother, the love of the father compelled the song. And what I want to say in this is the kindness of God in Christ Jesus is overwhelming. And we can't take it for granted. It's why we worship. It's the visible, tangible, real evidence of God's love for us. It reminds us that before anything took place, we were a child of God. We've been a child of God since the day we were conceived. We've been a child of God, well, since before the foundations of the world, I knew you, is what God says. The psalmist says it this way, out of Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I stand up. You perceive my thoughts from far away. How paternal is that? Parents, have you ever looked across the room and you're like, don't. Kid didn't say anything. You're like, what? Oh, how'd you know? Right? Anybody ever have that? You just, or anybody, any son ever have that? You're just about to do something. Mom's like, no. How'd you know? Because I'm your mama. I'm your dad. I know that dumb look. I know the ER bill afterwards. <laughs> you perceive my thoughts from far away. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. One of the things I love most is to see uh, um, like a room full of people and hear a baby cry and all moms kind of incline their ear and then one walks off. That's the squeal of Charlie. Off she goes. Why? She knows she's familiar with the ways. Before a word was on my tongue, you knew it completely. You hem me in behind and before. Anybody here ever put their kids in the pack and play? Little prison for children? Yeah? Right? Hear these words again. You hem me in behind and before. You put me in a playpen so I can safely be me. Because I don't know better, you put me in a safe place. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hands on me. Like, are you getting the fatherly images here? Do you realize how much he loves you? Have we as a church forgotten that we are dearly loved by God and our worship should be in response to the fact that he's hemmed us in before and behind and he's laid his hand on us in a gentle way. The psalmist goes on to say, such knowledge is too wonderful for me to grab. It's too high for me to reach up to. Where could I go to be apart from your spirit? If I go to the heavens, you'll be there. If I make my bed in the grave, you will be there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn and I cross the sea, even there your hand will be to guide me and you will hold me fast. You will hold me fast. If I say surely, I will hide in the darkness and be out of sight of you. Darkness is like daylight to you. Even the darkness is not dark in your eyes. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was knit together in the secret place. Your eyes saw my unformed body. Your eyes saw my unformed body and all my days were laid out by you before I lived one goes on to say how wonderful and how precious are your thoughts O oh God I wonder if the psalmist was in a moment of recognizing he's on God's mind 
and how wonderful it is to know that in the mind of God, our name cycles. If you're a parent, you know your mind is never far from your children. Sometimes you look up and go, I don't know what's going on, but I feel like the police are on their way. Or I feel like this is wrong and you just want to check in. Why? Because your mind and your heart is on your children. The scripture says it this way. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God, and how vast are the sum of them. How many wonderful thoughts do you have? If I were to count them, they would be like the sands of the seashore. I awake and I am with you. That's a weird ending. Unless you've ever held a baby while they sleep and they wake up. Anybody ever had that experience? Little babies just cashed out. And they kind of, ah. Uh, and they wake up and their first thought is like, ah. Uh, and then they see you and they're like, ah. Oh, and they snuggle in. I awake and I am with you. I am held in the grip of God. He loves you. I, I can't say it clearly enough. He loves you. He loves me. I can't get over why, but he does. He loves you recklessly, courageously. He seeks you. He desires you. He would leave the 99 to search for you. He left heaven and glory for you. He left it all for you to hold fast in his arms and save the thing he loved, the one he loved. He is the shepherd who seeks the one, and the one is you, and the one is me. And we are not left to our own. But we also know that before we spoke a word, there was a song echoing over creation. And he was singing over us. He knew your days. You're not an idle biological mistake. You are knit together fearfully, wonderfully, purposefully made in Christ Jesus. How do we as a church forget that? We don't. We lean into it. Before you were worth anything, you meant everything to him. Recklessly in love with you is how we can define God. He is recklessly in love with you. Courageously in love with you. Our theology is one. We don't find God. God finds us. And recklessly he has searched for you. And the calling is yours to respond to the love of God. I'd like to have you stand. We're going to sing this song and spend some time remembering why we worship. There's really two responses to where we're at today. First response is this. If you don't know Jesus Christ... It is all I want to offer to you. It is everything. To know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you're in this room today and you're like, oh, I don't know him as my Lord and Savior, I'm gonna ask you to respond maybe a little recklessly, maybe a little weird outside of our, in our West Michigan culture, but I'm gonna invite you, if you don't know Jesus Christ, I'm gonna invite you just to come on down while we go back to singing. And we'll pray together. And he can introduce himself to you here. You can confess your sins, give your life to Christ, and be a new creation. Doesn't mean it all works out easy. You have to live into your faith. But you can become a Christian today and you can meet him. But there's another thing. That God intends to light the darkness, to light up the shadows. There's no shadow he won't light up. Mountain he won't climb up. He's coming after you. If you're a Christian in this place, do you not know that you are the light of Christ dispelling the shadows? You have friends who don't know Jesus. You have family who don't know Jesus. And you are the ones 
who get to live into the words of God. The word of God that he sent us out to be faithful witnesses to him. There's no shadow he won't light up if we, the church, would go and shine the light to those who don't know him. If we who have an inside relationship could kick down the walls and the fearful barriers around faith in people's lives and allow them to meet Jesus Christ. He'll climb the mountain. He'll go through the walls. He'll light up the darkness through you. He'll do it through you. His spirit-filled, fully redeemed, and purposeful church. So let the words play for a minute. Who is it who doesn't know Jesus in your life? What if you're part of their redemption story? Better yet, you're part of their redemption story. Go and light the shadows. Climb the mountains carrying the gospel with you everywhere you go. Break down the walls that people have a fear of a religious church and introduce them to the most unreligious person ever, the Lord Jesus Christ who loves them, who died for them, who, in a word, recklessly loves them the way he loves you. Please don't leave this place if you don't know Jesus Christ without receiving him. And please don't leave this place if you know him, unwilling to shine the light. The calling of the church is clear. If any would like to receive Christ, you can come down during this last song or after the worship service. I would love to pray with you. We're gonna finish the song. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, my friends, it's time for the church to leave the building. You are dismissed.